All right, y'all. I got a doozy for you today. I mean it. Uh, let's see what I did there. Um, we're talking about amines today. And amines are just nitrogen-containing compounds. Typically, N R three, where R is equal to like a hydrogen or alkyl group. Uh, there can be other things, but those are the, the main ones. So we've got our groups here. And we have, remember, we have ammonia. We also have a primary, secondary, and tertiary amine, just like alcohols, right? And that lone pair on there means that it's going to be basic and nucleophilic. <clears throat> okay. And this is going to help us dictate the chemistry of the nitrogen or amines. So the general structure and bonding of an amine is that since it has that lone pair, it is, does have four different groups on it and it is sp3 hybridized. Um, it's also trigonal pyramidal because the, uh, if we're talking about the um, molecular geometry. And since we can have potentially four different groups, it might seem like we can have chiral amines However, let's take a look at this structure here where we've got four different groups on it. And you can see that uh, the way I've drawn it, I have an equilibrium arrow. And that's because this nitrogen can, I've referred to it before in the past as like an umbrella in the wind, right? And so this umbrella right here can just flip inside out, back and forth, back and forth. And the once it does that it leaves you with the mirror image as shown on the right and this is something called a barrier to an or an inversion and nitrogen has a low barrier to inversion meaning that it can happen at room temperature and so these four different groups are uh, on paper going to look like make it look like that amine is chiral however since it's um got a low barrier to inversion it, I guess technically it is a chiral amine. However, you can't isolate one pure enantiomer of an amine because you would always get a racemic mixture. That being said, we can have chiral ammonium salts because there isn't, it's almost like a carbon. If you have four different groups on it, it's going to be tetrahedral and it's chiral. So <clears throat> that's more just kind of like fun, fun fact, I guess. It might pertain to some of the chemistry, more specific types of problems, but not necessarily the reactivity. So nomenclature and physical properties, as always, I want you guys to do on your own, because that's just, um, you don't want to hear me just read the book to you, right? So um, let's move on to spectroscopy. Now spectroscopy, um, first we want to talk about mass spec. So this is a review. A lot of this chapter is a review actually, so we can move fairly quickly and we will. And hopefully you guys find this as a helpful review. But nitrogen, since they are trivalent, they are typically they are going to be an odd mass in the mass spec. And so that's usually a, a good indication that you have a nitrogen and it screams out and it's super helpful in determining what you have. The general formula, therefore, is CnH2n plus 3, and then the nitrogen at the end. So that is different than a hydrocarbon, which would be CnH2n plus 2 <clears throat> for a completely saturated compound. Okay. Now moving on to NMR, as well as IR spectroscopy for amines. Uh, again, we have primary, secondary, tertiary amines. This is a primary amine. And in an NMR, those two hydrogens on the nitrogen are gonna have a wide range from 0.5 to 5 ppm. That's for a variety of reasons. They're gonna be broad and they're also going, I mean, they can hydrogen bond. And so those hydrogens are pretty dynamic and uh, moving around. And that's why they're really moving around the NMR. They're, the IR for those two uh, NH stretches, you're gonna see two absorptions, even though those are technically like symmetrical, what we have is two absorptions at 3,300 to 3,500 inverse centimeters or wave numbers. And those two absorptions are for a symmetrical and an asymmetrical NH stretch, as I've mentioned before. So uh, for the secondary amine, we have similar NMR resonances for that NH. 
And then now, since we only have one hydrogen, we don't have a symmetrical and asymmetrical stretch. We have only the one NH stretch. And that means we only have one absorption at the 3300 to 3500 wave numbers. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the tertiary amine. There's not going to be an NMR pertaining to at least the NH bonds because there aren't any NH bonds. And then the same thing for IR. There's not any NH bonds, so we're not really going to see anything in the... Um, 3300 to 3500 region and those nr or the nc bonds those are going to be in the fingerprint region so that's pretty much all we're working with uh in terms of the tertiary i mean we're going to have to use other means to kind of determine that we have a tertiary i mean if we were trying to figure it out but if we have the mass spec it tells us we have an odd mass and we have no NH stretches in our IR, then that means we have a tertiary amine. So we can use that to help us out. Now for the proton NMR of, um, they're essentially alpha hydrogens, but the, let's say I'm extending this bond out to uh, carbon then R group, that hydrogen that's on the carbon bound to the nitrogen, I circled in blue, that you can kind of think of it as like an alpha hydrogen, it's alpha to the nitrogen, those range from two to three ppm. And those are that's gonna be the case for primary, secondary, as well as tertiary. I'm just drawing it here just because I have the space for you to make it a nice uh, legible chart. Now, since we have carbons as well, um, adjacent to the nitrogen, that carbon can be anywhere from 30 to 50 ppm and again that's the the one circled in green all right so uh, that's pretty much it for NMR IR and mass spec let's take a look at what we mean by those two absorptions one absorption and no absorptions for the primary secondary and tertiary I mean uh, you can see the circled portions are two stretches one stretch and no stretch it's pretty straightforward right um, now I want to give you an example of a couple amines and those would be specifically some super cool amines and that pretty much is all amines are awesome because um, they're they're obviously important right they're in their proteins or amino acids they're in all the drugs ever not that drugs are good or but some of them are obviously helpful to us but they're literally in like all the drugs <laughs> it seems like um but cadaverin and putrescine are also um some really cool diamines and so since there's two nitrogens in each of these they are an even mass and so that's when we have an even number of nitrogens and these ones are cool because they're actually part of we, the, they were made in the putrefaction process. So like the decomposition of a dead body will produce cadaverin and putrescine. And they're like foul smelling and toxic and really gross, but also super cool because chemistry, right? Because science. Also, I love uh, like forensics type stuff. So uh, while most of you might find that disgusting, I know some of you will find that interesting as well. Um, there's also things like adrenaline or epinephrine, aka epinephrine, noradrenaline, aka norep norepinephrine. Um, <clears throat> the only difference between these two guys is that methyl group that I circled, right? That's crazy to me, uh, but that's that's all there. That's kind of how it is with drugs in general. Is if you change one small thing on a functional group or in a specific area, then it's going to change its functionality. Uh, these two guys right here are mescaline and meth. There's a little, little breaking bad for you. I'm the danger. Also, I'm about to go ham on these gifts right now because they're super fun and I might enjoy it more than you guys, but I mean, I think you'll find it. Yeah, who, who cares? I'm, I'm enjoying it. I look out for number one sometimes, right? 
have fun with it. You guys, if I'm having fun, you guys are having fun. So anyway, mess. We kind of just brushed over mescaline. That's peyote, uh, and, and meth. Like the, it's crazy how similar all these structures are and what they do to your body. Almost similarly. Um, this guy right here, um, if you recall, looks pretty similar. I'll give you a second to think about it. I talked about it before. Um, but this is bufotenin on the left. And then the structure that I'm drawing on the right is another very similar structure. Um, notice the OH location, just off by one, one carbon. And this is called silicin. And so these two structures are actually really similar to a neurotransmitter that we talked about in the past, like not that long ago, like last week. And that is serotonin. Notice the location of the OH and the nitrogen doesn't have two methyl groups on it, but it has two hydrogens. That's serotonin right there. Bufotenin and silicin are actually hallucinogenics isolated from a frog as well as shrooms. And the other uh, for the silicin. Boom. Um, silicin is actually um, one of the active components in shrooms, but psilocybin is also another one. And that's basically where you take that OH and you add a phosphate group to it. And so that's, that's hallucinogens for you. Very similar to serotonin. And that, in my opinion, is why we you don't want to mess with drugs, man. They just, they can definitely i mean if you're they're taking the place of serotonin then they are you're, you're just gonna mess up the production and then your bank brain chemistry gets all messed up and then you get all messed up and drugs are bad okay but the chemistry is dope so let's talk about the basicity of these things uh remember basicity and nucleophilicity kind of go together and so this will help us better understand the reactivity of nitrogens as nucleophiles so when we're comparing ammonia versus to like methylamine, for example, um, we have methylamine is more basic or more nucleophilic, and that's because we have an R group on there. And remember, R groups are electron donating groups. If it's got more electron density on the, on the nitrogen or around the nitrogen, then it is a stronger base, and it's also going to be more nucleophilic. Um, if if we if sterics isn't an issue, so let's compare these to aniline and aryl amine. So remember that nitrogen is a good donor, like pi donor, and so we can create a resonance structure as I've drawn here, where we have the nitrogen lone pair donating into the ring. That's what activated that benzene ring. But that's also going to be taking away from the nitrogen's ability to attack either like protons or Lewis acids uh, or electrophiles as the nucleophile. And so uh, this resonance stabilization of that uh, aryl amine is going to cause it to be a weaker base and therefore also a weaker nucleophile. So... <clears throat> There's a few other examples we can give in terms of comparing the basicity. A lot of this stuff, again, is a refresher. So remember that carboxylic acids, um, when we talked about their acidity, we had uh, regular carboxylic like benzoic acid versus nitrobenzoic acid. The nitro group was electron withdrawing, and that made it more acidic, right? So the whatever the substituents on the ring can affect the acidity, or in the case of a nitrogen containing compound, it, they can affect the basicity. And so um, aniline with versus nitro aniline versus, versus methoxy aniline, um, we can compare these and try and determine which one is more nucleophilic or basic. Uh, which one has the most electron density on that nitrogen? Well, Remember, nitro groups are electro withdrawing electron density, so that one's going to be taking away that lone pair almost, while the methoxy is electron donating, and so it's almost pushing electrons towards the nitrogen, which makes it more basic. If we take a look at that lone pair in terms of resonance, we can see that that lone pair don't even care about protons or electrophiles because it's too busy in that resonance structure. You know what I'm saying? I don't even care. 
That's what's up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm is it too far. No, this is a, that's one of the best gifts known to mankind. So I mean, you're welcome. Uh, also, moving on, we got chemistry to talk about. So let's talk about um, <laughs> amines versus amides. So. Um, this is going to be very similar to the, um, the nitroaniline example where we have a lone pair mixed up in a resonance structure for the amide. So since that lone pair is donating to form almost like a pseudo, almost like an enolate, he's looking at the lone pair on the mean like, do you boo boo? Cause I'm a do me. You know what I mean? Look, I have a hard action for you. Um, and by that, I mean <laughs> the regular amine is going to be a stronger base or nucleophile because it's the lone pair is just sitting on there. Where on the nitrogen, ready to attack. On the amide, it's moving around. It's busy doing other things, right? It's doing, it's doing its thing. So, <clears throat> all right, let's take a look at some other examples. Um, so we've got... Again, another example that we've seen before. So this is a refresher. Awesome. Love refreshers. Uh, we got pyrrole and we've got pyridine. We saw this on an exam where we were talking about aromaticity and how we're screwing it up, right? Or how we're not. And so real quick, the first examples that I gave you were pertaining to resonance. This one is compar uh, pertaining to aromaticity. And so... Um, Remember, when we mess up aromaticity, we screw up the stability of that compound, and it doesn't want to be that way, right? So uh, in the case of pyridinium on the left and pyrolium, uh, we messed up the aromaticity of the, of the pyrrol group by protonating it. That lone pair is no longer able to donate to the ring. And so the pKa of that is like super low. It's 0 0.5 versus the pyridinium, which is five. That's because pyridinium is still aromatic while the protonated pyrrole is no longer aromatic. So it wants to give off that proton real quick so that it could be aromatic again and super stable. Okay. Okay. So the next example would be uh, piperidine as well as comparing to pyridine. Okay. Um, and these are obviously very similar structures. However, we the if we take a look at the nitrogens, we can see that the hybridization of the two are different. Now let me draw out the the acids uh, for you, the conjugate acid, and the pKa's. The pKa for piperidine's conjugate acid is eleven, while pyridinium is five. Still, didn't change. Um, and the reason why the pKa of the pyridines is so low is because that proton is sitting is is attached to the nitrogen that is sp2 hybridized now the sp2 means that there's more s character and um, that means that the lone pair is held more closely to the nucleus so it's happy and therefore less basic haha <laughs> less basic than a pumpkin spice latte that's for sure you know what I mean <laughs> again with the gifts <laughs> you're welcome so this particular topic was all about hybridization right so um, we went over resonance we went over aromaticity we went over hybridization um, and these topics are all definitely topics we discussed when we were talking about acidity and therefore basicity so let's see if we can knock a couple examples out real quick. What we want to do is draw this cool little structure and determine which nitrogen is more or less basic, right? So what we want to do is pay attention to the four factors when it comes to acidity because acidity and basicity go hand in hand. So uh, the remember the four factors are... in order from importance to uh, least important, elemental effect, then there's resonance effect, and 
followed by inductive effects and then hybridization. So the element effect, we're comparing a nitrogen to a nitrogen, so that's not relevant. We wanna talk about resonance or inductive effects. Those aren't relevant either. Uh, so we have to focus on hybridization. And in terms of hybridization, the most basic is going to be the sp3 because that has less s character and then the lone pair is further away from the nucleus and therefore less stabilized so it's just angry ready to attack things okay now let's take a look at chloroquine because we might as well talk about chloroquine while we're in covid 19 quarantine um we've got three different nitrogens in here but here's the thing we all obviously all the same element but these two nitrogens right here are actually able to so the nitrogen on top can do resonance and the nitrogen in the ring is kind of it's a unique aspect because it's got the aromaticity thing going on and those two are going to be very similar in terms of basicity so that means we're going to look towards the um, hybridization effect on this one and that's the answer for that. As this tertiary, tertiary nitrogen has a, the conjugate acid has a pKa of 11, so the weaker conjugate acid means we will have a stronger base. So we actually know how to prepare a lot of different types of amines already. Um, and we'll review some of those again, but we're basically going to talk about some nucleophilic substitution reactions, some reduction processes, which we pretty much know those ones, and then reductive amination, which is also going to be new, but very similar. And actually, I mentioned it in the past when we were talking about condensation reactions on carbonyl groups with nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> real quick, though, so A, the reaction A, we have an alkyl halide and ammonium. And boom, ammonia has a lone pair, right? We can do an SN2 reaction to substitute the alkyl halide or the X group. And that gives us a primary amine. If we took a primary amine and did the same reaction, we would get a secondary amine. Or if we took a secondary amine and we did the same reaction, we would get a tertiary amine, right? Well, let's say we took a tertiary amine and did the same reaction, what would we get? We would get a quaternary amine. And that's an, a nitrogen with four groups on it. And since it has four groups on it, it has a positive charge and is an ammonium. So now what we've got is a primary amine, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary amine. Um, but remember our discussion on R groups on amines. Our R groups are electron donating groups and make the nitrogen more nucleophilic or more basic. And that means that the ammonia compared to the primary amine is less nucleophilic. That means if we've made a primary amine in the reaction and we haven't necessarily gone to completion, that nitrogen can attack the alkyl halide and then it can continue to do that because it's got another R group and another R group. And so ultimately what we're going to end up is getting a variety of amines and that's garbage. We never want that. So what we can do is throw excess ammonia and then we can isolate our desired primary amine. And um, in addition to that, what we can do to isolate our quaternary amine or our ammonium is have an excess amount of the alkyl halide and that can drive that reaction forward as well. And so those are the, really the only two useful reactions in terms of formation of amines to form uh, or for SN2 reactions in this sense with alkyl halides. If we wanted a primary amine and we wanted to make it more uh, in an easier fashion, we could use something called the Gabriel synthesis. And that is using thalamide, which has a pKa of 10 because it's got mad resonance structure, uh, mad resonance on the top and the bottom of that double amide, if you will. So if we remove that proton on the nitrogen, we form this negatively charged species and the red arrows and the blue arrows indicate two separate resonance structures just to guide you but let's say that negative charge attacks an alkyl halide boom that's the sn2 that kind of compared to what we were talking about above now 
what we have is this thalamide here where the hydrogen is now substituted for an R group. Well, how is that useful, right? What do we care about that? Well, we know that uh, we know a couple of reactions with uh, amides, right? So we know specifically a hydrolysis of amides using base and some heat uh, can get you the amide, a primary amide, in this, or I'm sorry, can get you the amine, a primary amine in this case, as well as a carboxylate. And so obviously the desired compound is boxed up in that it's the primary amine. And so this is another way that we can isolate a primary amine with minimal amount of byproducts. So let's see if we can get a couple practice problems in which can't be prepared by the Gabriel synthesis. So we've got four different <clears throat> amines here. And we want to kind of think about what the synthesis or what the mechanism is for Gabriel synthesis to see if we could actually make these amines. So let's take a look at the first one. Well, if we wanted to think about what needs to form, we, remember we need an alkyl halide and then the nitrogen source is from the Gabriel or the thalamide. But that nitrogen attacks an alkyl halide, right? And the alkyl halide in this sense would have to be on a benzene ring and we know that we cannot uh, do SN2 reactions on uh, aryl halides, right? And so that means that this reaction is not going to work. The second reaction, it's a secondary amine, right? So that secondary amine is not going to work because Gabriel synthesis specifically forms primary amines. Now, let's take a look at the third one. We have a primary amine here. And so let's think about where the alkyl halide or what the alkyl halide looks like. That is a benzylic chloride, which is totally fine. That's great for uh, substitution reactions, very easy. And um, the amine would be, as shown here, obviously it's in, incorporated into the, the bicyclic structure of the, the thalamide derivative and that's an easy nucleophilic attack there. And so that leaves that as the only option as a possible Gabriel synthesis or product from Gabriel synthesis because the last one is a tertiary amine and that's not going to work again because only primary amines will work, okay? So a couple of amine syntheses that we already know, hallelujah, some stuff we know, um, are, those are going to be like the reduction of nitrobenzene with iron and acid or H2 and palladium on carbon or tin chloride as well as acid again. And this nit reduction of nitrobenzene gives us aniline and amine. <clears throat> and then we can also do reduction of a cyano group and that's going to give you with lithium aluminum hydride specifically because that guy reduces the crap out of everything. Um, it gives you the amine and then reduction of an amide with lithium aluminum hydride also gives you an amine. And so um, these syntheses we already know. And one thing I want to point out is that they are all reduction processes, right? They're all pretty much just adding hydrogens um, to uh, to carbons, right? Or we're getting rid of oxygens, and that's both definitions of reduction processes. So reductive amination is another means to get, uh, to obtain an amine. And it's going to be very similar in terms of um, the fact that we're adding hydrogens, but we're just using different reagents. And also we're gonna have some different intermediates. So we've seen this before where an amine attacks a carbonyl group to form an aminium or an amine. And in this case, an aminium ion, if it's reduced, we would get an amine product, right? That would be isopropyl amine. And so um, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna add a reducing reagent or a reduce, reducing agent, and that's going to be sodium cyanoborohydride as opposed to sodium borohydride. And sodium borohydride we don't want to use because it reduces ketones to alcohols. And 
we don't want to have that as a side product because this is going to be a one pot synthesis. So we can throw the amine, we can throw the, key, the carbonyl group, and we can throw the sodium cyanoborohydride in, and we will obtain our desired amine product. Whereas, as opposed to the possibility of isolating an imine and then reducing with, let's say, lithium aluminum hydride. This is also a possibility, and uh, I want you to keep that in mind as well. And this is something that I mentioned when we first introduced amines and their, uh, the possibility of re reducing them. So let's say we formed an imine product with a um, methylamine and cyclohexanone. We could isolate this and then reduce it with lithium aluminum hydride followed by water to quench the reaction. And, oh, sorry, that R group is supposed to be a methyl group from methylamine. And then we would end up with this secondary amine product. And so this is obviously a new way of making amines. And it's pretty fun, pretty, sometimes it's actually pretty easy in the laboratory as well. So there's gonna be a lot of different ways to make amines and you're just gonna to have to find the one most suitable for your set of molecules or desired compound. So ammonia with benzaldehyde. Obviously we can form a primary amine, but let's say we had additional benzaldehyde present when we did this. Well, then this amine can then attack the benzaldehyde again, followed by reduction with, uh, in this case, it might be a good idea to use the sodium cyanoborohydro. That, you can have every, that way you can have everything together and then you end up with this final product right here, which is a secondary amine with the same stuff on it, um, just done by reductive amination, as opposed to a nucleophilic attack on a benzyl chloride, for example. It just all depends on what you have on hand, what your goal is, and what your surrounding environment, chemical and uh, chemical environment is, what, what your molecules can withstand. So, Let's say we want to make this amine from the propyl amine, but we want to do it using reductive amination. How is we want to isolate this propyl amine portion and then look at what we actually added? We added two carbons, right? And so that means that our carbonyl group, because that's what reductive amination is on, has to have two carbons, and then that hydrogen is there as well. And there you have it. We just use propylamine and attack the acid aldehyde, acid aldehyde, and reduce it with something, right? Sodium cyanoborohydride or maybe lithium aluminum hydride, and you'll get your desired product, your secondary amine. So, one, another one that I want to point out is this one here, because what do you think is going to happen? Well, it's a there's only one thing, right? There's an amine and a carbonyl group, so why not do an intramolecular uh, nucleophilic attack on the acyl group and then do form an imine, a cyclic imine, and then reduce that with lithium aluminum hydride, for example, and isolate our cyclic amine. There you go. Fancy stuff, right? So. Um, there's a variety of ways we can do these reactions, and uh, I just want you to keep in mind the intramolecular ones are always super fun as well. So, the last, yeah, this is the last, like, reaction, for example, that we're, uh, that we're going to be going over, and uh, at least with the means, and it's called the Hoffman Elimination cool thing about the Hoffman elimination is that it's doing or using chemistry that we already know and we just learned it actually and so we have this amine on the left and we have the alkene product on the right how does that happen well if you think about it that would be almost like an elimination reaction to form an alkene right so like why not do that well NH2 minus is a terrible leaving group it's super basic super basic things are not good leaving groups, right? So why don't we do what we always do? Just make it a better leaving group, right? And so how might we do that? Well, with the chemistry we know already, remember nitrogen is a good nucleophile and it can, you can methylate it 
with a methyl iodide. And remember, it keeps doing this because now it's a stronger nucleophile. So if we have excess methyl iodide in there, we can form an ammonium salt. And so that would be this nitrogen with that ring on there, but also three methyl groups. This positively charged nitrogen, it doesn't want to be positive, right? And so now it's looking like a good leaving group or at least a better leaving group, right? So <clears throat> now that elimination reaction with the base doesn't look so bad. And now we can probably, what we're, what, what we're going to do, this choice of base is silver oxide. So it's Ag2O. You can think of it as the structure of like water where it's bent, but instead of protons or H, it's two silvers. And this is, this is pretty much equal to a hydroxide. And this hyd uh, silver oxide, for example, or hydroxide can attack a proton and create that pi bond, which forces the uh, the nitrogen or the amine out. The tri so we form trimethylamine, water, and silver iodide because the iodide was the counter anion for that ammonium salt. And we form the alkene circled. Now you might think, okay, well, what about this particular alkene as a product? It's a more substituted alkene, so that's better, right? Uh, it is better in terms of stability. However, we can't obtain this product because of steric hindrance. So think about that. That nitrogen, that ammonium salt, those, that nitrogen has three methyl groups on there and it's huge and it's just bugging, just knocking things away. And so the proton that's easily accessible is the one on the less substituted carbon. And so that's what we're going to end up with is the less substituted alkene, uh, which is contrary to what we might think. Um, for example, this this reaction here, we have potassium tert-butoxide. Uh, the elimination of the H1 equivalent of hydrogen bromide is going to result in this more substituted alkene as opposed to a least or the least substituted alkene when we do a Hoffman elimination with methyl iodide, silver oxide, and heat. And that product is shown here. <clears throat> Again, uh, something that we've gone over before, diazoniums. I went over this when we went over electrophilic aromatic substitution because I found the, these reactions super helpful in terms of synthesis. So the mechanism is here for you, but we don't really need to go over it because we've gone over it before, but it's there for you if you want to reference it again. The same thing with these reactions. We've got the diazonium, and we can add a nucleophile of a variety of nucleophiles to get different products, as shown here. Uh, the reminder on the bottom also was the cool reaction where we had that tribromobenzene uh, that was formed from aniline, and then so on and so forth, right? We've done this. So what we haven't done is secondary amines. So that aryl amine is pretty much a primary amine, right? But secondary amines in the presence of sodium nitrite and HCl don't form diazo compounds. They form something called nitrosamines. And this is because that R group takes the place of a hydrogen. If that, or let's take a look at this structure here. We, if we remove one of those protons in this mechanism, that's where we would stop for secondary amines, right? And so, uh, the mechanism's there for you. I'm not going to redraw it. Um, but if that R group wasn't there, then we can actually move forward with the tautomerization and then so on and so forth to get us the diazo compound. But R group's there. So we stop at the nitrosamine. Just like when we have this ethyl methyl amine, we have the nitrosamine forming because it is a secondary amine. So uh, some additional practice for you. Let's say we had this alcohol and we wanted to form this amine. So we've added a nitrogen with a methyl group on there. How might we do this? Well, we just learned a variety of ways to make amines, and one of them was with a ketone or with an alkyl halide. So if we're thinking about these mechanisms, alkyl halide was a nucleophilic attack, and that was a SN2 on a secondary alkyl halide, that's not ideal. So the best option would probably be to go with the uh, reductive amination and 
In order to get to the ketone from the alcohol, we have to add PCC. That gives us the ketone that we desire, and then we can throw in methylamine. After the methylamine, we form the amine, right? And then we can reduce that with uh, lithium aluminum hydride or sodium cyanoborohydride. And um, that's going to give us our desired product. So remember that the amine formation is the loss of water and anytime results in the loss of water and anytime we have a loss of water we want to drive that reaction forward by perhaps using a dean stark if we can depends on the boiling points of the products uh dean stark aka tony stark as i like to call it because i'm super cool anyway let's move on we've got an alkene and an amine product let's see how we can make it so this alkene has five carbons and the product has five carbons that are highlighted in red and as well as a nitrogen and a couple more carbons so the blue portion we can actually add in the form of an amine how do we get the other portion connected to that nitrogen though well we could do nucleophilic substitution if we could get an alkyl halide how do we get an alkyl halide from an alkene? Well, there's a variety of ways that we can actually, first of all, there's a variety of ways we can make this compound. You can make an aldehyde on the end and then do reductive amination, but we just did that. So I want to show you this one. Uh, BH3, H2O2, and hydroxide will give you an alcohol, but it's anti-Markovnikov addition. So it's a terminal alcohol. PBR3 on alcohols will give you a bromine or an alkyl bromide and boom we've got those five red carbons with a bromine there and now we can toss in that amine to do the sn2 reaction and we've got our final product soups cool so moving on to another reaction this acetal to the final product so i would just throw an h3o plus we form the ketone and then we can throw in the uh, propylamine followed by reduction, a reducing agent, and then we've got our product, boom. So that one's pretty straightforward. This one is weird. The reaction reagents, we, we haven't seen those in a minute, or kind of, I gave you them a couple weeks ago, but uh, we wanna get to this final product here. Well, we see that the cyclohexane was, is in the product, but there's only one of them. So we need to cleave that carbon-carbon double bond and then add a nitrogen to it somehow. Well, we know how to cleave carbon-carbon double bonds and we can get two ketones out of it. Do you remember? Do you remember? Let's see. Ozone and dimethyl sulfide. You got it. Got them. All right, so what that's going to do is make those two ketones. And now what do we do? Throw an ethylamine, followed by a reducing agent. Boom, boom, bang, boom, bang. We got our final product. So it's obviously, I'm not going to say it's easy, but because I know it's not, but super fun, right? I'm having fun. I hope you guys are too. Um, it's just going to take some practice. I know there's tons of reagents. I don't want you guys to freak out. Just practice and you'll get you'll get some we got acid chloride now right we want to make the final product i've highlighted the portions in red that we add and now i'm highlighting the portions in blue that we started with oh well, besides the ring right so what reactions do we know with acid chlorides that can add carbon carbon bonds well we know that um organocuprates can actually add Eth an ethyl group, those two red carbons on the right that we want to add, we can add that without um, compromising the structure of the carbonyl group, right? Because we want to maintain that carbonyl group so that way we can do a reductive amination after with um, ethyl amine. And so after we've added the two red carbons, we have our ketone now instead of an acid chloride. And now we can throw that, that bad boy in and do the redu as well as the reducing agent. So I'm not drawing in the reducing agent because we can do cyanoborohydride or the lithium aluminum hydride, whatever. Um, one thing I kept forgetting about the re reductive emanation portion is the amine plus a mild acid, right? So 
that's what's going to drive that amine formation forward, the acid catalyst. <clears throat> so now instead of an end goal, I want you to tell me what you're going to get when, I, when you throw these reagents in. So, I mean, I hope you've been remembering, obviously you can pause the video and then try and write stuff down and see what you get. Uh, but let's do this here. So remember methyl iodide in, in excess means that we're adding a methyl group to the nitrogen and we're gonna do it as many times as we can to the point where we get a, an ammonium. And so that is the structure drawn here. Now what's the purpose of the ammonium? It makes it a good leaving group, right? And so that Ag2O, that silver oxide, that's the base that comes along and removes a proton to give you an alkene. So remember, this is going to be the least substituted alkene. And so that is going to be the terminal hydrogen because it's way easier to access. And so that's the proton drawn in blue. And that's going to give us uh, that terminal alkene. And that structure is going to be drawn right here. Also, obviously, the water and the AGI, the silver iodide. Oh, no. <laughs> little intermission for you. Threw a pizza on a Traeger barbecue because it can. I'm not about to turn the oven on. And the kids want pizza. And so does daddy. It was delicious. It was a pesto with mozzarella on it and tomatoes. So it was like a caprese. Bam. Um, also, the pepperoni was only on half because that was for the kids. Because I'm still not eating meat and it's going all right. And they're shutting down meat packing places. So, I mean, that's cool. I don't mind. Let's try this extraction right quick. We got a carboxylic acid and... For the record, I th we already went over this. So we did carboxylic acid uh, extraction. Pretty sure I already did amines. I threw, I said something about like, I think we did cocaine or something. Um, so we're about to zoom, zoom through this. So all of these guys are soluble in methylene chloride, the organic layer. Methylene chloride is not miscible with water. It's on the bottom, water's on the top. I'm gonna abbreviate these as ROOH. PH, CH3, and RNH2. So once we, since we have a carboxylic acid, we can throw 10% sodium hydroxide. What that's gonna do is form the carboxylate, ROO minus. That's not gonna be super soluble in water. And the uh, toluene and the aniline are still going to be soluble in methylene chloride, the organic layer. Now we can separate the two layers quite easily because they are not miscible. It's like water and oil and the methylene chloride can drop, drop, drop back down into another container, whatever it is. And now that we've isolated or separated our toluene our, and our aniline, um, as well as our carboxylic acid that's left in the water, we can add acid to our aniline and toluene mixture and that acid's going to protonate the amine to make an ammonium salt. And we're gonna add aqueous acid, so it's water and acid. And now that ammonium salt is going to be super soluble in water. And so the toluene is always going to remain in the organic layer. And so now we've just separated the last two compounds. And there you have it. We've separated three things just by an extraction using a variety of um, pHs. Fancy. Alright, so let's try another problem. Uh, this one's cool because it's uh, it's cool. And um, <clears throat> so there's this structure right here with the cool little acetal on the side. This is another one. And remember this, this is a very um, familiar molecule. Mama no! That was saffron. That was and the sassafras in my root beer gave me cancer because formaldehyde. The one on the left is MDMA, aka ecstasy. And you can actually make MDMA from saffron on paper, right? Um, we can do it with an SN2 reaction or we can do it with reductive emanation. 
okay? So let's try with the SN2 reaction first, and I'm going to use red for the SN2. Notice that there's three carbons on coming off of that benzene ring, and both of them. So the only thing we need to do is add the amine. How can we add the amine to a double bond? Um, well, again, there's 8,200 8, ways that you can probably do this, but what I wanna do is, since we're doing an SN2 reaction, is I wanna make it an alkyl halide. And how can we make it an alkyl halide? Throw in HBr. HBr, remember we protonate the alkene to form a secondary carbocation, which then gets attacked by the bromide, and we got our alkyl halide. Now that alkyl halide can um, react with methylamine, and that methylamine, after attacking, results or it results in the final ecstasy product. Pretty straightforward, right? Kind of weird. So reductive amination, let's do this one in blue. <clears throat> the target molecule for this one is going to be a ketone, right? Because we have the same number of carbons coming off of that chain, or the benzene ring, and then it's reductive amination. So we have to do a carbonyl group. So how can we get there? Well, we have an alkene. If we throw in H3O+, we're going to get an alcohol. And after we get the alcohol, we're actually going to hydrolyze the acetal as well, but that's all good. Even though the synthesis is probably isn't that great, it's good for us to kind of remember how to do these things. So that's okay. We broke up the acetal. I'm gonna oxidize that alcohol on the alkyl group with PCC. Can't be done on the phenols. And then we form that acetyl group again with formaldehyde as well as acid. And then boom, boom, bang, boom, bang. We got that ketone that we wanted. We can throw in the amine and followed by a reducing agent, a rut row. So I don't know if you guys knew this, but the way I make this is I do screen record on my like notability app and then I do a voiceover. Toads didn't realize that I messed up with the reagents, my bad. But that'll just be the exit ticket question, right? So I messed up on this reaction because silver oxide and heat, that's for the Hoffman elimination. Um, what we need to throw in there for this one is the methylamine followed by like sandal borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. So my bad, mistakes happen. I'm not about to go back and re-record that video though. So. Uh, just so you know, wrong reasons to get to MDMA above, but maybe I did that on purpose. Let's just say that. All right. So the next reaction <laughs> is <coughs> this crazy looking diazo ish thing. And basically we need to figure out how to make this. So what we need to make it from is benzene containing compounds or benzene just and since we know how to make uh, we can make aniline uh, we can make diazonium or the diazo um, let's just say we know how to add these chlorines on there as well you guys can do that electrophilic aromatic substitution I believe in you and um, the way that this final product forms is if we have aniline reacting with this diazo compound, it's just another electrophilic aromatic substitution where the diazo is the electrophile and that nitrogen donates the lone pairs in and we get a nucleophilic attack at the para position. And that just shuffles the electrons around. It stabilizes the positive charge or neutralizes the positive charge on that nitrogen and you get the desired final product. So this is actually a pretty cool reaction and um, I never really went over it. That's why I'm doing this reaction now because um, that's, that's really all there is, is if you have a diazo group and you have a like a strong activated benzene, you can do this reaction. And these di this final product is actually something called like an it's the it's a very common structure for azo dyes, and azo dyes are um, 
just a lot of variety of different um, vibrant colors and some indicators are azo dyes as well. All right, so that is pretty much it for the amines. Um, a lot of this stuff is stuff we already know. It's just kind of um, putting it together in like a nice little neat little box so that you have it for memory recall. So um, just put a little bit of practice in. There are a lot of homework questions that I'm assigning, but this is the reason why I'm giving you so many is that because, <laughs> is that because, uh, is because they are going to be helpful for the final because a lot of them have just reagents that we need to reintroduce ourselves to and kind of remember what's going on, okay? So there's also oh, the last couple that I wanted to make sure you do are the spectroscopy questions. And um, those, again, I'm not saying specifically these ones are going to be uh, on the final or anything related to it, but spectroscopy is in the final and it's of course going to be uh, important to practice it in any form okay so i hope you guys found this helpful um, and if you have any questions as usual just let me know